is. And first of these, uh, the Watson, Helen, Audrey, and Miles Davis Prize. This is named in honor of the longtime director of Science Service and his wife. Uh, the prize was established in 1985 through a long-term pledge from Miles and Audrey Davis. It honors books in the history of science directed to a wide public. And this year, we particularly like to thank Miles and his daughter, Laura, for their generous gift of an endowment in recognition of which the prize is being renamed. And now I'm going to ask Laura Davis to say a few words. Good evening and greetings from Houston, Texas. It is my privilege to speak about the endowment of the Davis Prize to encourage and honor books about the history of science and the renaming of the prize to honor both my grandparents, Watson and Helen Davis, and my parents, Dr. Audrey B. Davis and Dr. Miles Davis, who's with us tonight. Watson was the longtime director of science service and also founded the science talent search with Westinghouse, now sponsored by Regeneron, to promote science research by high school students. He believed in the popularization of science and the role of science in developing our society. My mother, Audrey, who was born in November, fittingly, started the Davis Prize in 1985 and was a pioneer in many ways. She was the first woman curator of medical sciences at the Smithsonian Institution's Natural Museum of American History, where she worked for 26 years. She started as a chemistry teacher and met my father, Miles, while studying at the Harvard School of Education in 1959 and earned her PhD from the Johns Hopkins University in 1969. She published many books about the history of medicine and traveled wildly, widely to give professional talks and collect editions for the Smithsonian's medical and dental collections. After the Smithsonian, Audrey helped start the Dr. Samuel D. Harris National Museum of Dentistry in Baltimore, which opened in 1996. She also helped found the Ocular Heritage Society. My father, Miles, here with us tonight, earned three degrees from Harvard, including a PhD in statistics. He taught biostatistics at Johns Hopkins and had a long career as, as a statistician at the Social Security Administration. The Watson, Helen, Miles, and Audrey Davis Prize is a fitting and important living memorial to the scientists in our family, and I hope an encouragement to scientists and science writers everywhere. Happy Thanksgiving to all. Thank you very much, Laura, and congratulations. Um, and the winner, of the, the first winner of this newly endowed and renamed prize is Matthew Stanley for his book, Einstein's War, How Relativity Conquered Nationalism and Shook the World, published by the Penguin Group in 2019. The committee received upwards of 35 titles to consider this year, and they were a terrific group of books. Every author had chosen a topic that was strikingly innovative and wrote for general audiences with great flair. The committee chose Matthew Stanley's Einstein's War, an absorbing study of high-level science during an epic period in history. Stanley shows how Einstein's life was deeply enmeshed in a world driven by the disruption of the First World War and explores the role that Arthur Eddington played in establishing the theory of relativity, even though the two became ostensible enemies on either side of national lines. The book is impressive in scope, beautifully written, alert to both the science and to historical method, and embeds science in the politics and cultural context of the day while telling a compelling story about scientific internationalism. It's also very accessible to a general reader. Stanley demystifies Einstein's supposed genius and draws attention to the inextricable links between science and politics. The committee felt that Einstein's war brilliantly captures the setbacks and excitements of a highly significant moment in our field. So congratulations, Matt, and uh, if you'd like to say a few words. Thanks, Jan. Uh, I'd like to start off by thanking the Davis family for endowing the prize. Um, I think this is hugely important, and thanks to HSS for 
supporting work aimed at the general public, which I think is increasingly important um, in, in the times in which we find ourselves. So I'm, I'm really grateful to be part of that. Um, thanks also to the prize committee um, for reading through, as you say, a, an enormous stack of uh, top quality books. Um, I'd uh, particularly like to thank my home institution, um, NYU's Gallatin School of Individualized Study, and uh, Dean Suzanne Wofford for her unending support for this kind of work. Um, and in particular, my colleague Amanda Petrujic, who in some way inspired this book by writing such beautiful prose that one day I said to myself, I want to write something that's as lovely as that. Um, and I'm still working on that, but thank you, Amanda. Um, the project would never have gotten uh, off the ground without my agent, Jeff Shreve, uh, at the Science Factory, and my editors, Daniel Crew and Stephen Morrow uh, at the Viking and Penguin Groups. Uh, but most of all, thanks to my family, uh, my daughters, Maya and Zoe, for putting up with lots of Einstein stories over dinner for a very long time. Uh, but most especially, my indefatigable wife, Janelle, uh, who supports me in so many ways um, and who I'm so grateful to have in my life. Thanks again to everyone. Thank you, Matt. Congratulations. Uh, and now the Pfizer Prize, uh, established in 1958 through the generosity of Pfizer Incorporated, a diversified research-based company. This prize is awarded in recognition of an outstanding book dealing with the history of science. And this year, the Pfizer Prize is awarded to Maria Portuondo for her book, The Spanish Disquiet, the Biblical Natural Philosophy of Benito Arias Montano, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2019. Centered on the humanist exegete Benito Arias Montano, uh, who lived from about 1525 to 1598, the Spanish disquiet sets the protagonist within the grand sweep of approaches to knowledge in early modern Europe. Rejecting both artisanal empiricism and ancient philosophy as viable pathways out from the epistemological cul-de-sac that he and other contemporaries feared, Arias Montano undertook a hugely creative and courageous effort, integrating a wide range of forms of knowledge in order to offer a wholesale new interpretation of the natural world and God's plan for humanity within it. Drawing on her vast scholarship, incisive analysis, and elegant storytelling, and immersing her account within the ferment of period approaches, Maria Portuondo masterfully charts the quest of this wide-ranging polymath. Arias Montano was highly respected across Europe and widely read in his own day, but has been nearly forgotten as a consequence of subsequent narrowly teleological accounts of the scientific revolution. His scientific enterprise emerges from this study as a product of intense soul searching spurring ambitious proposals and grandiose designs. Biblical exegesis grounded knowledge of nature to enable humanity's salvation, demonstrating how modern science emerged from many competing intellectual strands, some of which have faded in retrospective memory. Arias Montano's magnum opus demands from the historian of science an engagement not only with meteorology, mechanics, or botany, but also with biblical philology, and mosaic philosophy. The Spanish disquiet offers an exemplary alternative model for how and why to write the history of any kind of science, perhaps especially of those roads not taken. So I'll shortly invite Maria to say a few words, but first um, we'll have a few words from Ed Harnaga, uh, who represents Pfizer today. <laughs> Hi, good evening, everybody. I'm happy to be joining you tonight. Um, I lead communications at Pfizer and I have the pleasure of working with over 10,000 scientists and clinicians every day who focus on breakthroughs, scientific breakthroughs. And 2021 has been quite a year for scientific breakthroughs, one that I'm sure will go down in history um, for the work and that's happened to address the pandemic at light speed. Um, but, the 20, but the scientific advances that we're seeing today have only been made possible by the advances that have happened yesterday or in the past few years or decades or even centuries before. Um, the history of science society plays a vital role in shining a light on these advances and making sure that the impact is documented, recognized and celebrated. Um, since the 1950s, Pfizer has been proud to uh, sponsor this prestigious award, which every year recognizes an outstanding book dealing with the history of science. 
I'm honored to join you all in celebrating Maria um, and her wonderful work, The Spanish Disquiet. So Maria, let me hand it off to you and thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I have to first, uh, of course, thank Pfizer for underwriting this award for so many years and for its support uh, for, to the history of science society. Um, of course, also to the uh, prize committee who uh, read through this very, very lengthy book, um, not an easy read. And, uh, and I really appreciate your steadfastness in, in seeing it through. And, uh, and of course, in recognizing uh, my work, I'm, I'm extremely humbled by, by this recognition. Um, I see it more than a personal recognition, a recognition to, as I think the prize uh, announcement uh, uh, mentions very well, about paths not taken in history of science, uh, pursuits into the st study of nature that were pursued with as much passion and dedication as those that ended up, I suppose, leading to modern science, but that were nonetheless central and very important in the early modern world. Um, and, I, and I appreciate the recognition also for the field, not just of early modern history of science, but of history of science in the, in the somewhat periphery of Europe, right in Spain and in the, uh, and in the Hispanic world. Um, so uh, I, thank, I thank, of course, all the people who also collaborated or helped me get this book. I, I was happy to see J.O. Richard on the screen. He was one of the patient uh, editors of the Latin in the, in the book. Um, a number of other graduate students also helped out uh, with proofreading this very lengthy text. Um, Alice Bennett from uh, the University of Chicago Press with an exemplary uh, copy editor. And I have to thank, of course, Karen Darling for um, indulging such a long book with footnotes and, uh, and uh, seeing it uh, all come through fruition. Um, again, thank you. The History of Science uh, Society is always a welcome home for uh, those of us who like to uh, uh, take on these kinds of challenges. And, uh, and uh, all, I can, all I can say is uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations, Maria. Um, the Price Webster Prize is awarded annually to the best article published in ISIS in the previous three years. It recognizes original research of the highest standard and represents the finest our field has to offer. It's a pleasure to award the 2021 Price Webster Prize to Elise K. Burton for the article Red Crescents, Race, Genetics, and Sickle Cell Disease in the Middle East. This article offers an illuminating, detailed, and bold new treatment of a topic, the study of sickle cell disease, that has been extensively explored in the sciences of heredity and history of racialized science. It sets up an exciting and important puzzle by asking what can be learned by moving an almost paradigmatic case from the context in which it has been conventionally studied, largely the modern US, as well as parts of the African continent, into the transnational scientific networks of the 1950s Middle East region. Burton shows how the work of elite researchers studying sickle cell among marginalized Arab speaking communities served to harden otherwise flexible, complex and locally specific histories and practices into seemingly natural categories of race. In doing so, Burton explores, exposes and transcends the American bias in history and historiography of sickle cell in particular, and of race concepts generally, which focus on a distinctively US-based anti-Black racism. The article gives fresh insight into the mechanisms through which global geopolitics played out in specific communities and structured seemingly timeless and universal scientific categories to insist upon a more capacious global history of racial formation. The empirical research is stunning. Burton draws upon material from, from an impressive number of languages and dialects, while simultaneously guiding the reader deftly through the details of post-war genetics. The article provides a sophisticated study of Arab and Turkish political history, demonstrating in detail the ways that such histories and local contexts served as specific resources for scientific ideas 
and in turn, how scientific data were put towards social and political ends. The article persuasively documents how the boundaries of scientific categories realigned to fit nationalist movements, decolonial projects, and contests over Cold War politics of belonging, and thus the political fabrication of racial classifications. The article is relevant and accessible to anyone interested in the politics of classification, the history of race science, the history of genetics, and the history of the modern Middle East. Along with its empirical sagacity, careful analysis, and impressive creativity, Burton's research marks and enacts opportunities to work for greater social justice in the sciences, in our communities, and in our own field. So congratulations, Elise, and if you'd, we'd be glad to hear from you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I don't have much to say except that it was a huge surprise um, and honor to receive this award. Um, and I just want to mention, especially for other early career scholars in the audience, that I prepared and submitted this article when I was still a, a postdoctoral fellow, and it very nearly did not get published in ISIS. Uh, the former editor of ISIS um, almost gave it a desk reject, um, except sent it out for an exploratory review first. And so perhaps the greatest thanks I have to give is to that reviewer um, who encouraged actually that it be uh, provided a full review and consideration for publication and ISIS. And so those um, reviewers um, who then uh, gave me further feedback um, were enormously important. They were a bit wary, um, I have to say, about whether this would in fact be an appropriate um, submission for ISIS. Um, and so I think it's a, a great honor um, and accomplishment that eventually it did make its way to publication um, in this journal and then eventually um, into the hands of the prize committee. Um, so for all of those who were able to recognize the potential of the first draft and then the final published version of this article, I thank them, um, of course, and I hope that this is the beginning for seeing new kinds of work, transformative work, um, in ISIS. And then uh, the other um, thanks I have to give, of course, beginning with the archivists at the National Library of Turkey, um, who gave me access, free access to material that otherwise would have been inaccessible to me. Um, and of course, to the many women and scholars of color who really nurtured and encouraged this article from its earliest conception. Um, so the few I'm, I want to mention by name in particular are Jada Karamursel, uh, Tanya Elal Lawrence, uh, Kate Fleet, and Mr. Uh, Dr. Adel Alaki, who was actually um, a physician um, in Yemen in the 1950s. Um, and so I want to thank him for allowing me to interview him. Um, so that's all I, I want to take up your time with today. And thank you all uh, again very much for this honor. Thank you. Congratulations, Elise. Uh, the Hazen Prize. The Joseph H. Hazen Education Prize is awarded in recognition of outstanding contributions to the teaching of history of science. This year, the prize is awarded jointly to Michael P. Clough and Douglas Olchin. This year's prize is awarded to two extraordinary scholar educators who have contributed significantly over the better part of the last two decades to enhancing science education in the K-12 curriculum by introducing themes and insights drawn from the history of science. Both Michael P. Clough and Douglas Olchin are leaders in their field, internationally recognized for their work and winners of a variety of prestigious awards. Through development and core understanding of the role played by nature of science instruction, Clough and Olchin share the notion that the history of science provides the perfect framework to debunk narratives of science and more broadly, of the production of knowledge centered around the outstanding or genius individual, the stalwart, the trailblazer, and other such similar tropes. Their numerous books, articles, talks, pedagogical innovations, and website productions have provided education experts, young scientists, and science teachers working in classrooms all over the world with novel methods of bringing science to life to a youthful audience. We would highlight particularly Olchin's original role-playing simulations developed on Galileo 
nuclear techno science and Rachel Carson to help make fundamental issues about science come alive for K-12 students. And Clough's leading role in the development of the Story Behind the Science website, which is full of material, as the website puts it, to help students explore the development of key science concepts through the eyes of the scientists who were involved. Both Clough and Olchin have proven themselves throughout their careers to be deeply committed to finding ways to allow K-12 students to appreciate the dynamic and contingent quality of the doing of science. Olchin has had an active presence in the HSS, being himself a former chair of the Committee on Education, as well as in several other international organizations, including the International Society for the History, Philosophy and Social Studies of Biology, and the International History, Philosophy and Science Teaching Group. Clough has held various leadership positions in the Association of Science Teacher Education, the National Association of Research in Science Teaching, and the National Science Teachers Association and with colleagues has raised more than $2 million in funding for his research. Together, their work has reached hundreds, if not thousands of professionals in Europe, in the USA and in Latin America, eager to find better ways to teach the nature of science and to engage with students on the social role of science and scientists. Awarding this year's Hazen Education Prize to both Clough and Olchin is for this committee a matter of recognizing the tremendous significance and value of teaching the history of science to K-12 students in today's world. And what could be more resonant with the very idea of the nature of science than to acknowledge that bringing the history of science into a broader system of education can itself only be successfully accomplished through a variety of different, albeit overlapping and complementary contributions from more than just one individual. Many excellent and equally committed educators are what the world needs today. Olchin and Clough are examples to follow, and we laud their work on behalf of the history of science and science education. So I'm not sure that Michael Clough is here, but uh, Douglas Olchin is here. Um, I'd like to thank the Hazens for their support of education, which includes not just this particular prize, but uh, other projects through the History of Science Society, some of which I helped um, shepherd through as uh, chairman of the Committee on Education many years ago. I really do hope that this uh, award opens up the awareness of the opportunities for historians to engage with science educators as an expansive audience that can simply amplify their work to a, a much, much larger audience and put it in concrete terms that are really meaningful to people. And I hope that in recognizing uh, just briefly some of my work, people will be aware of some of the resources that I've, I've worked on um, through my expertise as a historian and carrying that over to the education field. So uh, a book called Teaching the Nature of Science, Perspectives and Resources, which talks not just about how to use history to teach science, but how not to use history, uh, given the rampant uh, misuse and ideological tainting of history, as we all know, um, in fields outside of the professional histories, historians of science. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Joel Hagen and Fred Singer, who I worked with in a book, a 1996 book, Doing Biology, in which we kind of launched off of Conant's case histories, which are well known, but instantiated them in a new style of teaching, which engages students in inquiry and solving problems on their own. Um, that then has led to an extensive website, shipseducation.net, which now includes dozens of case studies that all engage students in problem solving, testing hypotheses, answering critics, thinking about ethical problems in research, all in a historical context and embedded in historical narratives um, that make the science authentic and alive for them. Um, and I think it's interesting that these cases were not just written by me. I worked with science teachers and each case represents the fact that we've been able to broaden our horizon and spread the history out to other people. Um, 
Uh, I'd like to hopefully uh, bring to light the volume that I co-edited with Bob Dukoski on the history of science in non-Western traditions. Again, an important component in expanding the audience for the history of science, not just in among historians, but among science educators and all the science teachers who have lots of minorities and people in other disciplines to bring into science. So these are all resources that we've worked on. Um, and I, I'm sorry, Michael isn't here to join us. Uh, we're good colleagues, though we're not necessarily partners. Um, but I think we would agree that there are all these opportunities for historians to use their scholarship, to share their scholarship, and not to water it down, not to uh, think of it merely as a service to another community, but to enhance the value of their work by finding people for whom it will be relevant and concrete. And I invite you all to join me and Michael in that endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, congratulations. Uh, the Philip Pauli Prize is awarded for the best first book on the history of science in the Americas written in English. And this year, the award goes to Emily Pauli, different spelling, uh, for her book, Nature of the Future, Agriculture, Capitalism and Science in the Antebellum North, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2020. This witty, insightful, and tightly argued book shows how entrepreneurs and improvers in an agricultural region of the 19th century United States invested the breeding of crops, plants, and animals, as well as the management and accounting of their farms with intense and diverse forms of value. When they discussed how to breed high yield dairy cows or search for precisely the right words to describe the sweetness of an apple, the agricultural improvers of New York State were also working through a language of commercial capitalism. When they spoke of debts to the land, they informed and were informed by both chemistry and regional politics. Some of their speculative visions of the future seem absurd in retrospect, and indeed some of them failed spectacularly. Yet others became foundational to agriculture, agrarian life, and modern relationships with food and land. One of the accomplishments of the book is to show how difficult it was to distinguish wild prognostications from sober plans. The nature of the future is particularly attentive to how science became a subject of public discussion through the busy medium of the agricultural press. In so doing, Emily Pauli centers a community of knowledge makers whose parochial squabbles and earthy concerns have much to teach us about the creation of both American environments and agricultural science. So congratulations, Emily. So I'd like uh, to thank HSS and the committee very much for this honor and to the many, many people who helped with this book. It took me a very long time to write and my acknowledgements are almost embarrassingly long and a lot of the people in them are um, here today. I want to use this time though to say uh, this prize means a lot to me in particular because I got to meet Philip Pauli very early in my graduate career. Uh, he came to Penn and he said very dramatically in a talk, strawberries are culture. And I wrote that down, strawberries are culture. <laughs> and it actually gave me hope uh, that agriculture was really worth studying, which at the time was not as clear as it seems now to me. I got to have uh, just a couple of conversations with him before he passed away. And in those conversations, he was obviously brilliant, but also very kind and encouraging. And I know that this book would not have been the same and might not have happened without them. So just in Phil's honor, first, I thought I would say strawberries are culture. <laughs> and second, I would just like to say that if anybody junior or contingent who's working on the history of science and environment or agriculture or science and the climate crisis, which is what I'm working on now, wants someone to bounce ideas off of or to have a conversation with, I'm gonna put my email in the chat. Um, I'm on sabbatical. I think conversation is important and I owe a debt. Thank you very much. Congratulations and thank you. The Ranger Prize 
uh, was conceived in the Earth and Environment Forum, a group of scholars interested in histories of knowledge about the land, sea, and sky, and in all manner of physical, human, and life sciences as they've been practiced outdoors, in transit, or on a global scale. The Ranger Prize reflects HSS's commitment to supporting emerging scholars and their work, especially digital works. The 2021 Ranger Prize is given to Whitney Barlow Robles for her article, The Rattlesnake and the Hibernaculum, Animals, Ignorance and Extinction in the Early American Underworld, published in the William and Mary Quarterly in 2021. The jury truly enjoyed the article's vivid prose and provocative thinking, bringing together perspectives from the history of science and environmental history, the article studies the timber rattlesnake. This native of Eastern North America was an object of both knowledge and different kinds of ignorance among early British naturalists between the 17th and 19th centuries. In a bold move, Robles writes rattlesnakes into her story as historical agents, exploring how this particular species behaviors enabled and disrupted 18th century projects of study, extirpation, and conservation in ways that reverberate in current conservation efforts aimed at them. The article is highly original by tying animal agency to questions of agnotology, indicating how despite its cultural omnipresence in early America, the rattlesnake's cryptic ecology allowed it to evade the naturalist gaze and flouted the work of colonialism. Robles is sensitive to a whole range of contexts and voices, situating the story not only in a world of settler colonialism, but also in one of transatlantic exchanges and indigenous traditions of interspecies obligation. Through a varied and creative use of sources, she manages to tease out the tensions that characterized past snake-human relationships, thus offering her readers a story that goes beyond archival biases. For all these reasons, we think the rattlesnake and the hibernaculum is a more than worthy winner of the Ranger Prize. Congratulations, Whitney. Thank you so much for this honor and for all of those kind words and huge thanks to the prize committee uh, for, for this as well. I would certainly exceed my two minutes if I tried to actually enumerate all of the friends and scholars and archivists um, and scientists as, as well who made this article possible. But I will very much say it was a joint effort across the board. Um, I do have to thank my family. My husband, William Robles, uh, read many different versions of this article. And my daughter, Luna, was just a few months old when I was putting the finishing touches on it. Um, I'll also have to say that I'm very fortunate to be able to publish and work with the William and Mary Quarterly. It's just this amazing publication. The editor, Josh Piker, and the managing editor, Meg Musselwhite, are, are sort of legendary for the amount of developmental editing and fact-checking that goes into each and every one of their articles. Um, and I'm also indebted, of course, to the labor and generosity of the seven external reviewers. Um, so again, very, very grateful to everyone involved. I'll also give a really quick teaser. There's a continuation of the present day story. So I had the chance recently during the pandemic to go with a state biologist to see the secret den of New Hampshire's last remaining rattlesnakes um, while I was six months pregnant, no less. So if you're interested in hearing how these 18th century dynamics of secrecy and ignorance are playing out in current conservation practice today, there's a book coming out with Yale University Press in a couple of years called Curious Species. So thank you again for this honor. Congratulations. And uh, I want to know where the New Hampshire lair of the rattlesnake is. Um, the Rossiter Prize. Uh, the Margaret W. Rossiter History of Women in Science Prize is awarded in recognition of an outstanding book on the history of women in science, which may include discussions of women's activities in science, analyses of past scientific practices that deal explicitly with gender, and investigations regarding women as viewed by scientists. These may relate to medicine, technology, and the social sciences, as well as the natural sciences. This year's winner is Sharon Strokia for her book, Forgotten Healers, 
Women and the Pursuit of Health in Late Renaissance Italy, published by Harvard University Press in 2019. It's been clear for some time that most of the healthcare in late medieval and early modern Europe was in the hands of women. But it's one thing to be aware of that fact and another to be able to document its contours in any detail, given that much of this care took place in domestic spaces and was transmitted from generation to generation through oral instruction and apprenticeship. Sharon Strockier breaks through that impasse in her remarkable study, Forgotten Healers, Women in the Pursuit of Health in Late Renaissance Italy. Through meticulous archival research, primarily in Florence, she has reconstructed women's work as agents of health in contexts ranging from the highest levels of court society to commercial pharmacies staffed and run by nuns to the city's pox hospital where the nurses, orphan girls from poor families, were responsible for making the medicines they administered. In the process, she builds up a picture of women's medical work as differentiated, collaborative, results-oriented, and dependent on well-developed social networks in which knowledge flowed sideways and upward, not merely from top down. While focusing on women, Strockier's book offers a powerful methodological model for redefining the history of medicine in ways that acknowledge the centrality of non-elite and informally educated knowers to the history of healthcare. Sadly, uh, Sharon Strockier is not able to join us um, uh, on this occasion, uh, but uh, we send our congratulations to her as the winner of the Rossiter Prize. The Rheingold Prize. Uh, the Nathan Rheingold Prize, formerly known as the Ida and Henry Schumann Prize, was established in 1955 by Ida and Henry Schumann of New York City for an original graduate student essay on the history of science and its cultural influences. The 2021 Rheingold Prize goes to Oliver Lucia for climate conscious, Caribbean commodities, and Holdridge Life Zones, 1940 to 1970. This essay traces the development of Holdridge Life Zones, a bioclimatic classification designed by US forester Leslie Holdridge and widely used today to model environmental effects of climate change. Lucia argues that Holdridge developed his classification system specifically for the tropics in the context of American extractions of natural resources in the Caribbean during World War II. Unlike previous deterministic climate models, which correlated climate zones with human societies and civilizations, Holdridge's model identified groupings of associations based on elevation, rainfall, and temperature, and focused on the ability to grow a particular crop in a particular life zone. While Holdridge himself viewed his life zones as intimately tied to the physiognomy of specific tropical landscapes, later scientists scaled life zones up to larger regions, ignored the physiognomy and the focus on extraction, and focused instead on ecosystems and climate change. Lucy's essay is well-written, persuasively argued, and thoroughly and richly executed. It provides important context to the nature and origins of current approaches to climate change. So congratulations, Oliver, and um, uh, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. Thank you so much for um, this award. Uh, I would like to first thank the Rheingold Prize Committee and HSS. Uh, I feel truly honored to have been awarded the Rheingold Prize. Uh, there are many people who have helped to make this paper what it is, but I would just like to especially note several important people now. Uh, first, I would like to thank Professor Michael Dove for his initial encouragement of my interest in this topic. A wonderful email from Professor Megan, Megan Rabbi also helped to give this project liftoff. I would like to thank Professor Debbie Cohen for her thoughtful comments at a critical juncture, and 
I would like to express my gratitude to Professor Bill Rankin and his article workshop class for helping me to understand and to do the work required to turn a term paper into something more. Uh, lastly, and most importantly, I want to thank my family and my partner for their continued support. Uh, thank you so much. Congratulations, Oliver. Thank you. And finally, uh, the Sarton Medal. Uh, the Sarton Medal is the most prestigious award of the History of Science Society. It honors George Sarton, the founder of ISIS, and one of the founders of the modern phase of the history of science. It's been awarded annually since 1955 to an outstanding historian of science selected from the international scholarly community. The medal honors a scholar for lifetime scholarly achievement. And the medal was designed by Bern Dibner and is donated each year by the Dibner Fund. This year's winner of the Sarton Medal is Bernadette Bonsaud Vincent, Professor Emerita in the History of Science and Technology and in Epistemology at the Université de Paris 1, Panthéon-Sorbonne. Over more than 40 years, Professor Bonsaud Vincent has been a highly original and influential scholar who has integrated philosophical and sociological perspectives with historical analyses of scientific ideas, practices, and technologies. Her approach is rooted in a long tradition of French scholarship that is philosophically astute and politically insightful. Her methods and achievements are exemplified in books such as her Paul Langevin, Science et Vigilance, 1987, Lavoisier, Memoirs d'une révolution, 1993, the History of Chemistry with Isabel Stengers, translated into English in 1996. Chemistry, the Impure Science with Jonathan Simon, 2008. And Carbon with Sasha Love in 2018. Professor Bansaud Vincent has authored or co authored at least 16 books and edited or co edited another 16 volumes, including ed editions of primary texts. About half of her 120 research articles and essays have appeared in English, including in the History of Science journals, ISIS, Annals of Science, and British Journal for the History of Science. In both her work on the physicist Langevin and on the chemist Antoine Lavoisier, Bonsoir Vincent's aim is to replace hagiography at the boundary of memory and history with critical narrative and analysis that deconstructs the origin and perpetuation of mythic histories and biographies. In their history of chemistry, Bonsoir Vincent and Stengos move away from triumphalist history toward an account of the construction of scientific knowledge, which de-emphasizes heroic discovery in favor of the history of the professions, as well as the history of ideas. In chemistry, the impure science, co-authored with Jonathan Simon, she reiterates earlier insights into the categories of artificial and natural by way of arguing that the dual essential nature of the chemical sciences is the active production of manufactured objects as well as experience and theory-based knowledge. In that way, it is less than pure. Bonsoir Vincent and Simon extend the notion of impurity to harmful effects that pose ecological, ethical, and political dilemmas. These themes of impure science, techno science, constructed scientific objects, and science without borders come together in Bonsoir Vincent's and Sasha Lever's book, Carbon, a kind of poetic philosophical biography of the chemical element carbon from the beginnings of life on Earth to the threat of global warming. Bonsoir Vincent's work is uniquely original and also highly collaborative including joint projects with colleagues in France, the USA, Germany, and elsewhere. She has directed more than 20 doctoral dissertations at the Université de Paris-Nanterre and the Université de Paris 1, often co-authoring publications with students and helping launch careers of younger scholars. Teaching and lecturing positions have taken her to Barcelona, Madrid, Vienna, Bielefeld, and elsewhere recently including fellowships at the Science History Institute in Philadelphia and the Huntington Library in San Marino, California. 
Penseur Vincent is a Chevalier of the Légion d'Honneur and a recipient of several other major prizes, as well as an honorary doctorate at the University of Lisbon. Professor Bernadette Pensol Vincent is an engaged intellectual, not only in her academic scholarship, teaching and service, but also in speaking to the challenges of the scientific and technological enterprise for the present and future of our society. So congratulations uh, to her. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, Bernadette uh, is not able to be with us on this occasion, but she will be joining us tomorrow, uh, tomorrow afternoon, for a special uh, session, uh, conversation, in which she will be uh, interacting with a number of uh, uh, distinguished historians of chemistry uh, in a conversation about her work. And so uh, we look forward to that event and to uh, hearing from her then. And that concludes the uh, awards ceremony uh, of the History of Science Society. Uh, congratulations again to all of our winners um, uh, and congratulations and thanks to the committees uh, that judged the awards. <laughs>